Welcome to our webinar on the wonderful sea cloud voyage to Spain and Portugal. We are repeating the webinar that we did on July 1st because so many people have asked us to see it again. And also we've had eight cabins become available. So we wanted people that might want to take one of those cabins to see it again. The situation on the sea cloud has improved so that more cabins have opened up and mask wearing is not required on the sea cloud or on our outings, except when we go into museums and go into covered places like that. At the, at the end of this webinar, we'll talk more about the discount and also about future cruises, and we will take live questions and answers. So now let's turn to our feature presentation, our webinar on the sea cloud, Spain and Portugal. And thanks to everyone who is tuning in today to join us for this special presentation. It is definitely a pleasure to be here with Victor Emanuel as we discuss one of our favorite programs, pretty much any program we do above the sea, aboard the Sea Cloud. But uh, today we're going to be talking about our special trip that we have coming up next year, April 19th through 29th, uh, Spain and Portugal aboard the Sea Cloud, aboard this lovely ship. And uh, I am going to be taking you through this trip day by day so that you can see experientially what people on this trip will, uh, will, will, will enjoy. Uh, we'll talk about some of the birding, we'll talk about some of the historical and cultural highlights, and of course, we're gonna talk about the ship itself, uh, all the things that makes these programs so special. Before I continue or get started rather, I'm going to turn it over to Victor Emanuel, who uh, is going to lead with some other comments. I've had the good fortune of being on the Sea Cloud about 10 times, and it's some of the greatest experiences of my life. It is an amazing ship. It is a historic ship. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. It was built in Germany in the 1920s and has been, been uh, remodeled and, and kept in beautiful condition. And of all the trips I've done on the Sea Cloud, this is one of my favorite because we have so much time on the ship at sea looking at birds, hearing lectures, but also we get to visit two countries, Portugal and Spain, that have an amazing history and a connection themselves with the sea, particularly Portugal, but also Spain because of Columbus. So it is a step back in the time to be on this trip. And we have a fabulous lecturer who's gonna lecture about the history of the Mediterranean and we have some great birding. So, I really encourage you to look at the itinerary and think about this trip. Okay, thank you, Victor. Um, and so what we're gonna do now, everyone, is we're gonna go ahead and get started here. And uh, prior to my uh, beginning the presentation, I do want to highlight the fact that the subtitle of this trip is called A Bird's Nature and Culture Tour. Um, any trip aboard the Sea Cloud is special. And we like to think that one of the reasons for that is that there's something for everybody. We design these programs with a multiple, multidisciplinary intent in mind so that those who enjoy birding can do so, those who just simply wanna enjoy the ship can easily do so, and those who are into history, culture, sightseeing, excursions, and activities may also do that. Um, but anyway, without any further delay, uh, what we're gonna do is I'm going to show you a map to begin uh, orienting you on exactly where this trip will operate and the trajectory of our, of our travel route. Uh, of course, Portugal and Spain form the southern end of the Iberian Peninsula. And just a moment, I had a little technical thing there. Okay, uh, they form the southern end of the Iberian Peninsula. And we call this trip uh, sport, Spain and Portugal, but the majority, the overwhelming majority of the time is spent in Spain. We start, we do start in Lisbon where we will spend a full day before we will working, before working our way around the southern end of the Iberian Peninsula from the Atlantic Ocean into the Mediterranean Sea before concluding at Valencia. Victor? Yeah, I'd like to add that before you get on the ship, before the main trip starts in Lisbon, we have a pre-trip in Portugal where people can see more of Portugal. And uh, 14 of the people who were on the trip last year did it and they just raved about it during the whole cruise. How, what a wonderful time they had in Portugal. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Victor. And uh, we'll 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 come back to that at the at the end of the program as well. But for for now, though, what you're this map, you're going to see it uh, repeatedly throughout the presentation again. So to keep you oriented as we move through. But uh, the trip does start in Lisbon and typically what happens with our sea cloud programs is that we do not get on the ship until late in the afternoon. Uh, of our first full day together. And so what that means is that we have a full day in Lisbon and we have organized a guided walking tour with very excellent high quality professional licensed guides that will lead us through the city and so that you will get to see many of its most famous and important landmarks. Um, I will come back to this slide shortly, but uh, to take you through the route from the top of the city you are looking down an expanse of Park, uh, Eduard, Parque Eduardo VII or uh, King Edward VII Park. And this is, this is from an elevated perch uh, in the city looking down into the central area. At the very end of the park, there is a statue of the Marquis de Pombal, who was, uh, who was renowned for having rebuilt, port, rebuilt Lisbon in the late 1700s following a catastrophic earthquake. Uh, I have a photo here, an image of the of the statue, because one of the things that you will that will jump out at you about Lisbon immediately is the fact that it is a city filled with architectural and statuary wonders. We will work down the Avenida Liberdad to uh, Rocio Square, which again is just a it, it demonstrates the the architectural wonders that in its building construction and design. Uh, the city is filled with statues and fountains, uh, a famous location here. We will continue into the Terrero do Paco and the Rua Augusta Arch. The arch is to the left in this image, towering above the big plaza. It is highly scenic. It's very beautiful when you, you walk through it coming down the Rua de Augusta. From the other side, you enter the arch. And then suddenly, I mean, you enter through the arch into this big plaza, the painted buildings, the red tiled roofs, uh, and you're not far from the water here. It's truly one of the iconic landmarks of Lisbon. Here's this slide again. Now, Lisbon is divided up into what they call bairros. These are called historic neighborhoods, and perhaps the most historic of them all is the Alfama district. And it is a it is a, a picturesque part of the city. Uh, there are viewpoints over it uh, with a, the colorful buildings, the red tile roofs, et cetera, the cathedrals and churches all around you with the Tagus River beyond. Uh, another uh, sort of a renowned site here in Lisbon. We will go to the Belém Tower. And Belém is the ancient harbor, the old harbor from which the voyages of discoveries can, uh, commenced in the 15 and 16, the 14, 15, 1600s. Um, and this is, uh, this is sort of a classic landmark right down there along the coast, the Tower of Belém. Not far away is the Monument to the Discoveries, a massive concrete uh, edifice that was erected starting in 1960. And it was done to, uh, it, it basically exists to romanticize that period in history when Portugal was um, at the leading ed edge of progress, when people like Henry the Navigator, uh, Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Diaz, and Ferdinand Magellan um, paved the way for Portugal to dominate in that age of that early age of discovery. Um, it's a scenic monument. You get up close and per up close and personal. Photographic opportunities abound. In the right image, the lead. Uh, figure is Prince Henry the Navigator, who was the sort of the first of the discoverers, you might say. We will conclude our time in Lisbon with the, the visit to the Geronimos Monastery, which is a massive uh, Gothic construction. It is a beautiful building. Um, it is right on the coast, and it is not far from. Well, it, it's where we're how we're going to conclude our day in Lisbon. Overall, Lisbon has so much to see, um, but we feel that the day that we spend there, it's a full day, but an excellent day that you really get to see the highlights. 
So what happens next is that following our city tour, we board the ship in the afternoon in the port of Lisbon. And our next destination, our first destination, is going to be Huelva on the southwestern coast of Spain. However, to get to Huelva requires a night and a full day at sea. And that is a time when we, we on our sea cloud programs, we pretty much require a first full day at sea because it gives everybody a chance to settle in. It gives you a chance to get used to the ship, to learn your way around it, and frankly, to just enjoy the many amenities that the ship and the staff have to offer. It is also a time when both vent staff and sea cloud staff uh, offer, you know, make presentations, offer different activities on board the ship. Victor referenced um, onboard presentations. We're going to be traveling with a wonderful man named Larry Wolf, who's a professor of medieval history. And uh, Larry will be making presentations throughout the voyage. However, it is also a time for birding. And while we're at sea, we have a good chance to see an array of pelagic species, birds normally not seen from land or on land. And what you're seeing here is a, a slide containing a number of birds, all of which we have reasonably good to high chances of seeing. Uh, this is only, this is purely representative of what one can see out there. But uh, I'm just going to take you through this real quickly here. Um, top left, we have the great skua, a bird that winters in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and on our 2019 trip, we saw at least a dozen of these wonderful birds, and we see them well. Below that, parasitic Jaeger, bottom center, northern gannet. Lower right, yellow-legged gull, which is the common large gull of the Southern Atlantic and Mediterranean region. And on the top right, Manx shearwater is a bird that we also have a chance to see. And so again, uh, you know what, while we're at sea, we do have chances to see some birds that uh, are really quite special and that we don't often see from land. Always, I'm always showing the map, everyone, because uh, I'm a map person and I like to keep people oriented on where we are. We will come into the port of Huelva in the morning. And Huelva is not nearly as well known a location as other large cities in Spain, places like Seville, Granada, Madrid, uh, Toledo, Barcelona, etc. Yet it's an important city and we will talk a little bit about that and it is there on the southwestern coast, and it's going to be the gateway for, uh, for our activities for the two days to come. So um, we advertise on these trips, we like to promote the idea, the notion that there's something for everyone. And we learned a long time ago that not everybody who takes a, a sea cloud trip with Vent is necessarily going to be wanting to go birding. And so, we offer an option for those who are interested in birding and natural history, of course, but we also offer options, alternative activities for those whose interest is more centered on history, culture, sightseeing, the arts, et cetera. And so we have done that here. And on the first day in Huelva, uh, the first option uh, is going to be a day in the historic city of Seville for those who prefer that. For the others, we're going to go birding in a region north and west of Huelva, uh, a region called El Andevalo, and we will conclude the day at a place called Marismas del Odiel Natural Place. So why don't we go ahead and take a little look, take a look at what each excursion has to offer? And on the 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 cultural historical uh, excursion, which is a day in Seville, you will see some of the most important. Uh, and historical landmarks in the city. Three of them here are bullet pointed in because these are the real standout places, the Plaza de España, the Cathedral of Seville, and the Real Alcazar. And the Plaza de España, here you can see um, a large grandiose building uh, constructed in uh, 19, or completed I believe in 1929. It was, it was designed to commemorate the, uh, the, the legacy of Spain and her former colonies in an 
Indo-Spanish uh, exhibition, something akin to a World's Fair. It is a beautiful place uh, constructed out of this red stone and brick and so on. From the Plaza de España, you will continue into the center, into the heart of the city, and you will visit the Cathedral of Seville, which is uh, a truly immense edifice. Uh, it, is, it is a primarily Gothic construction, and it is, I believe, the largest, one, if not the world's largest cathedral, close to it. Um, so let's go ahead. You, you have a view of the outside with the spires, the pinnacles, um, the, let's see here, the, um, the, the, the windows and the, the, the arches and so on. Inside, it is equally beautiful. I have included a representation of images to depict the different parts of the, in the cathedral's interior, uh, the various attractions. Uh, on, the right, on the right, the aisle, which shows the high ribbed vaulted ceilings. Um, the left, the, on the far left, the central nave, the top center, the main altar. And one of the, one of the uh, truly standout uh, things about this cathedral is the fact that this is where Christopher Columbus is interred and they have the Columbus, Columbus's tomb uh, uh, on display here. Following your visit to the, uh, to the Cathedral of Seville, you will visit the Real Alcazar, which this building, uh, really equally beautiful, but in a very different sort of a way. Uh, this dates to the time of Moorish occupation of southern Spain, and it's, uh, it was actually originally constructed in about the ninth, ninth century, and it was to house the governors of the Moorish Empire there at the time. Uh, later, during the, the Reconquista, or what's called the Reconquest, uh, uh, under Pedro I in the 1300s, it was uh, infused with a sort of, with a, sort of a Christian revivalist uh, bit of architecture. It is a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, site. And uh, again, with, in accompaniment with our local guide, uh, we will have an enjoyable visit here to the Real Alcazar. In addition to these three sites I've shown you, there will be other things that you will see, other places you will visit. For the birders, again, El Andevalo and Marismas del Odiel, Marismas meaning marshes or marshlands. The El, the El Andevalo region is where we will spend our time again, it's west and north of Huelva. We will spend our morning there, and in the afternoon, we will go to uh, Marismas del Odiel. There are a lot of birds possible on this day, um, and it just simply isn't, uh, there, are too, there are too many space limitations to show a large uh, batch of birds, but what I wanted to do here was to show you a, a nice, a handsome representation of what is possible. Birds like booted eagle, black stork, European bee eater, Iberian magpie, which is now split off the azure winged magpie, and Eurasian griffin, and of course, great spotted cuckoo. All of these birds are possible in the morning hours of this day. In addition to the birds, you will have strong exposure to the Spanish countryside. And so it makes for a real nice morning in the field. Uh, we expect to see most, if not all, of these birds next year when we do this trip. In the afternoon, uh, I've, I've discussed the Marismas del Odiel. In the top center, you will see an image up there that is a big expanse of green that, that, is, uh, that, is, that is channelized with a lot, with, well, it's filled with channels and so on. What this is, is a large marshland in a very unusual ecosystem where two rivers come together just before entering the Atlantic Ocean. And together they, they support a very large freshwater marsh ecosystem, which then grades into brackish, um, brackish environments. This is also an area of major salt production. And the, top, the photo in the top right, because of the heat, 
because of other conditions uh, of the during the warmer months of the year and the summer months in 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 southern Spain, uh, it's an area of major salt production. A byproduct of that is that there is wonderful wetland habitat for a, a variety of birds. So between these two different um, these these two aspects of the overall ecosystem in that area, you have a chance for a lot of birds, such as Eurasian spoonbills, as shown in the top left. European avocets, the beautiful European avocet um, in the center, and or pied avocet, I say, I call it European avocet, the pied avocet. The bottom left, um, sometimes there are thousands of flamingos that gather here. The bottom center, common ringed plover, is an example of a bird that does not breed there, but does migrate through. And the gorgeous red-crested poacher that is uh, depicted in the bottom right, which in my opinion is one of the most beautiful waterfowl species in the world. What you're seeing here is the sea cloud dockside. So when we do our we do our excursions away from the ship during the day, this is what you come back to. And the sea cloud is resting peacefully there. And this particular photo was taken by uh, one of our participants on the 2019 trip, which was the inaugural uh, voyage, the inaugural uh, offering. Um, so anyway, uh, at the end of the second day, we will be back on board the ship and we will continue, um, well, the end of the first day rather, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. On the second day in, in the Welva area, once again, we will offer uh, different excursion options. For those whose interest is history, culture, and so on, we offer what is called Columbus's Trail and Condado de Huelva. Condado means county, the county of Huelva, which refers to the hinterland or the interior. And then for those whose interest is more in natural history and birding, we will visit the famed Doñana National Park, which sits just to the east of, of Huelva. So, for those who are going to, who, who would be inclined to join the first option, some of the highlights of your day will be a morning at a place called the Wharf of the Caravels, which I'm going to show you what that is uh, in just a moment, a visit to the nearby community of La Rabida, and then an afternoon at Con in Condado de Huelva in the interior. The Wharf of the Caravels is where exists or where sits uh, replica ships of Co Columbus's three ships that he used in his uh, initial voyage to the New World, what would become the New World, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And the purpose of these ships, why they're even here, is because the Spanish government back in from 1990 to 1992, uh, in commemoration of Columbus's five of the 500 year anniversary of Columbus's first voyage, commissioned the construction, um, the reconstruction of these, uh, these historic vessels, the, these caravels. And it's really a very neat thing to do. It's fascinating. These are lifelike re reproductions and they are extremely accurate. And for people who ventured, uh, who, the, for people who join this outing, this excursion, you will have a chance to climb around um, on each of the ships and, uh, it, it, and receive a real dose of reality of just how small they are and what these sailors endured um, in their Atlantic crossing so long ago. From the wharf of the Caravels, you will continue to La Rabida. It is, a, it is uh, I think, formally known as the Friary of La Rabida. Um, it is a small, it is a fairly small monastery. However, its significance comes from the fact that this is where Christopher Columbus spent two years from 1990, uh, 1990, 1490 to 1492, as he was awaiting approval from Ferdinand and Isabella to, to begin his voyage. And so this is where he spent time and it is a fascinating thing to see. In the afternoon hours, uh, let me let me uh, he became friends with the head of the monastery, and the head of the monastery talked to Ferdinand and Isabella to get support for Columbus. 
in th two years. Originally, they were not going to finance his voyage, and then they decided to do it. Exactly. the the the, the history is the history is fascinating all the way through. In the afternoon, as I was saying, we will head into the interior uh, to the Condado de Huelva. And this is a very famous wine growing region of Spain. And really what this afternoon is about is a true gastronomic and cultural experience. Um, in addition to getting, uh, to getting exposure to what the Spanish countryside is like and a chance to visit this famed wine growing region, you will have a chance to visit a uh, to tour a wine cellar, to sip Spanish wines. You will have a chance to enjoy Spanish cuisine, but also you will have a chance to partake in a flamenco show. And this part of Spain is the origin of the flamenco style. Um, on the 2019 trip, when people came back to the ship at the end of the day, they were delighted. They were raving about how much they loved this day. And uh, so needless to say, we were thrilled ourselves to be able to offer it again the next time around. For the birders, uh, you will go to Doñana National Park, as I had indicated. If you're not aware of Doñana, it is a very important site in Spain certainly because it is an amazing birding area, but also because it, pro it protects and preserves a huge natural area that centers on the Guadalquivir River and the surrounding habitats. Um, as with the, the previous day, I cannot, uh, I just don't have the, the, the space to show all that is possible, but there is a very large number of birds possible on this day. Here is a representation of these things. Uh, top left, the purple heron. Underneath it, the beautiful common poacher duck. Uh, in the top center, little bittern, the iconic white stork, uh, bottom center, and red leg partridge on the lower right. Some of these images were taken by some of our tour leaders. Uh, Brian Gibbons is one of our longtime tour leaders who uh, has led many trips to Spain. Rafael Galvez has spent time there. Uh, it is a tremendous birding area. It's not more than an hour from the ship, and we will probably spend most of the day right in this area. Um, and uh, Victor wants to say- I was gonna minutes. say, uh, it was Roger Torrey Peterson's probably favorite area in Europe. He spent time in the Cota de Oñana. He wrote about it. He loved the Cota de Oñana because of the variety and abundance of birds. So it's a real treat to go there. Absolutely. It's, you know, birds, birds, birds all around you. And uh, it's just very, it's a very satisfying experience to spend time in this beautiful park. Uh, in addition to these things here, uh, it is also an exceptional place to see vultures and hawks. And the numbers of hawks and, well, birds of prey that you can see is substantial. Uh, booted eagles, uh, red kites and black kites, uh, black winged kites and so on. At the end of that second day in the Welva area, we will return to the ship and we will then proceed eastward. Now, one thing that I, I had intended to mention at the outset is that this whole region of southern Spain is, is what is known as Andalusia or Andalusia, which is an autonomous, a semi-autonomous region of Spain. And uh, this trip is, focuses on that. And so there is a theme from a historical standpoint, there is a, uh, a running theme throughout this trip is the Moorish history. And uh, I wanted to be sure to, to mention that before I, it slips my mind. Our next stop, once we embark at Huelva, our next stop is going to be Motril, down on the southeast coast. Motril is 212 nautical miles east of Huelva. And so it's a substantial distance, but it, it means more time on the, on the ship. It's, it's a night and a full 24 hours after that. And uh, it's really a delightful time because in addition to experiencing all that sea cloud has to offer, 
You will hear presentations from the event staff. Uh, you will also get to, the, the, as we know from experience, the C-Cloud staff has got a, a number of wonderful uh, activities and some surprises in store, which really helps to provide for just a really um, memorable and wonderful time aboard the ship. One of the highlights of, a, of this trip eastward is we will pass through the Strait of Gibraltar. At only nine miles in width at its narrowest, uh, the coast of Europe and the coast of Africa are practically within spitting distance, as the saying goes. It is, um, it's a very interesting thing to do to make this transit. It's scenic and um, really kind of fascinating. Uh, you will see the, the famous Rock of Gibraltar from the decks of the ship, uh, you know, with the help of binoculars, but you will see the Rock of Gibraltar. Um, it, is a, it is a place to see uh, birds and wildlife. Oftentimes, uh, birds that are migrating north from Africa in the spring will pass right over the strait. We had a large group of raptors um, that came over the ship on the 2019 trip. Um, but as we make our way east, we will have a chance to see uh, for other wildlife. A very special bird called the Balearic Shearwater. It, it nests on the Balearic Islands some distance to the east. Uh, we did ultimately see one in 2019. It took a little more doing than I would have expected, but we did. And uh, we, this is a bird that we will be pinpointing and especially watching for uh, the next time around again. In addition, there is other marine life out there, things like short-beaked common dolphins, uh, common bottlenose dolphins, uh, long-finned pilot whales, and even sperm whales. So there's a lot to a lot to think about and look forward to. And and there being at Gibraltar, and in fact the way it worked out on the last trip, we were eating lunch on the on the uh, deck of the ship where you're under the where you can eat very comfortably in shade and looking at Gibraltar. And you think about the history, that's where Hannibal, with the elephants, crossed over into Spain and then crossed the Alps to fight with the Romans. So they crossed. That's where the Moors crossed over from Africa to conquer what is now Spain and make it a Moorish country. Uh, in World War II, World War II, and, and also in the Napoleonic Wars, that was a big area of control by the British were, were controlling that area in order to control the Mediterranean. So it's so historic. And to be there and eat lunch and look out at Gibraltar with all those, that history is fascinating. Indeed it is. And before I move on from there, what is what is uh, a part of the, the fascinating quality of all this is that on one side you've got Gibraltar and on the other side you're viewing the city of Tangiers um, in North Africa. So now, I am going to talk about the ship a little bit here too, because you know we we build these we build these wonderful programs around the ship, but of course it is about the ship, and uh, it is a historic ship. It is a beautiful ship. Uh, I know that that uh, you know Victor feels as I do about it. Uh, it is. One, an anecdote that I sometimes like to, to share with people is that uh, I remember talking to a man one time who had come on board one of our Sea Cloud trips, who had joined one of our Sea Cloud trips, and he said to me, Barry, at the at the beginning of the trip, he said, Barry, I'm sure that this is going to be a wonderful trip. I'm sure the birding is going to be a, is going to be good. Uh, I'm sure the excursions are going to be well planned. But he said, honestly, I'm here for the ship. And I appreciated his candor because it's totally understandable. And so to experience the ship along with these other things is what makes it special. What you're looking at here, of course, is the leading in the left image is the leading edge of the ship um, as it moving forward under sail. Um, in the right image, this is uh, this was a photo taken by my colleague. Um, I think this is actually taken by Victor Emmanuel. Um, and it is standing amidships looking up into the rigging and the spars and masts and sails and so on. It's really quite beautiful. Victor? And it's also a, a step back into time because the sails are put up and taken down by the staff of the ship. It's not punch a button and have an electrical impulse that raises or lowers the sails. 
These are all done by people mm -hmm. climbing up there and unfurling the sails or furling the sails up. So it's a step back into time of this historic ship. And on during the cruise, there'll be a an evening where we hear a lecture by uh, the staff of the ship about the history of the ship. But it is a remarkable ship, historic ship. And probably it's been operating to take tourists since probably the 1960s or 70s. Probably less than a few thousand people have ever, um, of all the population of the world, only a few thousand people have ever been on this ship. Yeah, exactly. It's a very unique experience. So you're seeing the ship um, from a distance. Uh, you're seeing um, some of the obvious features of it, like the masts and sails. But why don't we take a little closer look here? Um, on deck, uh, I have got uh, I've got four images that 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 that, uh, that depict different parts of the ship. In the top left, this is what you're seeing uh, around midships, uh, around the middle of the ship. Uh, at an expanse of the deck and the exterior of a couple of the cabins here. And the wood construction, the wood finish on it, all the ropes and lines leading up, for, leading from the rail up, up below, from below the rail up into the, the, uh, the mast and so on. Um, the, the back right, in the, I'm sorry, in the top right, you've got what they call the spanker deck, which is um, a wonderful area just to, to relax. Um, and that's as close, and that puts you just right over the level of the water. Um, look, and from there, offering uh, more wonderful uh, views up, up into the rigging. The bottom left, this is what the ship looks like on the inside. This is an interior lounge adjacent to the dining room. Um, elegant, um, beautiful, artistic. Uh, it's, it's just a, kind of a pleasure to walk around inside and to look at all the, um, the wood carving and so on, um, almost all of which is original. Bottom right, uh, on board the Sea Cloud, the captain does in, uh, in, in most situations maintains an open bridge policy and you can go into the bridge and see the controls and instruments and things like that. The dining areas, there are two of them essentially uh, the lower right, this is what the dining room looks like. Again, quite elegant, quite beautiful, um, very well done. And it just goes without saying that the Sea Cloud services, the, uh, the kitchen staff, the, 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 the food service people, they're all highly trained, uh, personable people, which really adds to the enjoyment of your experience. The top left, this is the Lido deck. This is where you spend much of your time. This is where we host our lectures. Uh, it is also a place where we take a number of our meals. There, you're seeing at the near edge of the image uh, the corner of an outdoor bar, and it's wonderful just to have a drink. Um, you know, uh, whether you're you're sitting under the canopy or want to go out further back for a view of the water. The cabins. Um, there are essentially five categories of cabins on board the Sea Cloud. The first four, uh, which I have shown here, categories one through four, and they are labeled as such, they're all very similar. Okay, people often ask me, what are the cabins like on board the Sea Cloud? Well, here's, here's what four of them look like. Um, they are appointed and styled uh, almost identically. The primary differences being that uh, they come down to the square footage of the cabin the bed configurations, and also the number and size of the windows. Um, so, you know, uh, there are different, because of the design, owing to the design of the ship, uh, there are uh, varying numbers of each cabin category available, typically. The fifth type is called, the, are called the historic cabins. When the Sea Cloud was constructed, there were no main deck cabins. It was constructed with 10 cabins in mind, all of which are below decks. Each one of them, they were, and they were, they were designed to host the, uh, the Hutton Merriweather Post family um, and their assistants. And so each of the cabins is different. They're totally unique. 
And I am showing you cabin number nine here, um, partly because uh, it's, it's an example of what these historic cabins were like, but also because this, this one is still available. Um, anyway, so we've got the historic cabins and one of the wonderful things that the Sea Cloud uh, staff does during the trip is they, they ask people if they're willing to open up the cabins so that, and they offer a tour. And you can go from cabin to cabin to see what all 10 of them look like and uh, see the differences among them. They're all beautiful. This is just cabin number nine. I could do a whole presentation here on just the historic cabins alone. And that's true. And there was cabin number one, which was the cabin for uh, uh, Marjorie Mer Merriweather Post. Merriweather Post. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all very pink and white and, and beautiful light. And there was cabin number two, and they were connected by a, a, a connection, was for um, uh, her husband. Yeah. And uh, it was all wood and uh, much not a, a whole different feel to it. Yes, exactly. But certainly no less remarkable. Okay, so we will reach Motril, and as we as we did with Welva, uh, this this program includes one night dockside in the port of of Motril, and Motril is significant. It may be a city that you've heard of, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, but for our purposes, Motril is the gateway to the historic, beautiful city of Granada in southeastern Spain, and. Um, we will have uh, a full day. We will spend in Granada together on one day. And then on the second day there, which we will, we do not spend a full second day. We spend part of a day and we will have some options, which I will describe here as we get into that part of the program. Granada, uh, Granada is, um, as, the, as the Moors were being pushed out of Spain during the reconquest, Granada was the remaining stronghold. And we will visit this city built in, essentially in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So the surroundings to it are quite, uh, quite, quite pleasing, but the city itself is as well. What you're seeing here are just some images that give a representation of the architecture, the fountains, the building facades, the, the, the statues and sculptures of, of the city. Um, all of it come to bear in a nice presentation. We, with, with, a, with a local guide, we will walk a number of the city uh, streets for, for at least part of the day, uh, probably in the morning hours. Um, however, the thing that we will center on, the lead attraction of a visit to Granada, is that this is the site of the famed Alhambra. And we will spend probably uh, close to a, a half a day breaking up into smaller groups, being accompanied by expert local guides and touring what many people consider to be among the most beautiful uh, historic structures in the world. And it was, of course, was built by the Moors and within the Granada, there's the winter palace and the summer palace where they went in the summer and beautiful gardens, beautiful flowers, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful buildings. And to me, it is as remarkable as the Taj Mahal the beauty of the, of the whole Alhambra. Mm -hmm. And like in the Taj Mahal, they had stones that they put jewels in. And so they were chipped away and inside the stone, you know, is a, a part of a jewel. It is absolutely extraordinary. Truly, it is a massive structure. You know, it served as a fortress, it served as a home, it served as, as, as a palace. Set against the Sierra Nevada mountains behind it, um, it offers what is, I think, quite obviously a very appealing thing, uh, appealing uh, site. And another little bit of history that as you leave the Granada, and, and you leave Granada, you leave the Alhambra of the Granada, go back to the boat, and Mary's going to talk about that. I love the local guide pointing this out. You go over a hill along the highway, a, a high part of the highway, and there's a sign that says, Suspiro del Moro, the sigh of the moor. Because when 
the Moors and the, the, uh, the conquerors let them leave. They didn't kill them, they let them evacuate to Morocco. But when they got to the top of that hill, they stopped so that Mohammed II, the last ruler, could look back at the Alhambra knowing he would never see it again. And he made a deep sigh. And so there's a sigh on the highway that says the sigh of the Moor. Yeah, exactly. That's a nice memory there, Victor. Inside the Alhambra, um, these images couldn't possibly do justice to what the full experience is like. But nevertheless, as Victor had just uh, referenced, the, the Alhambra contains gardens, um, reflecting pools. Um, it can, it's got, you know, ceilings or intricately carved, almost like ceilings and walls like lattice were carved from stone and plaster, uh, beautiful stuccoed walls, um, pointed arches, uh, little spires and alcoves, uh, vaults, all these things. It's just sort of endlessly fascinating. And given the size of the, of the Alhambra, uh, you will need hours to walk through it and uh, it goes all too fast because it really is quite a wonder to see. And as you're walking around the gardens and between the buildings, there are birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were there last time, a flock of European mm -hmm. beaters, which I think are one of the most beautiful birds in the world, flew in to the Alhambra garden area and lit in a tree very near us. Yeah, and I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up, Victor, because uh, that does remind me that um, what you can see of you know European goldfinches and European siskins and even you know uh, crossbills uh, migrate other migrating birds, warblers, and so on that use the gardens. So yes, it's productive all the way around. Um, but sadly, it will be time to depart the Alhambra. And we will go back to the ship. And the next day, we have got a part of a day still in the Motril area. And here we will offer options. One option will be to visit what is called the tropical coast, meaning the Mediterranean coastline just west of the city. And we will go to two little towns um, by the names of Frigiliana and Nerha. We will spend a bit of time in each town Together, each of them is, is unique. Together, they form a, a very nice combination of uh, what, the, what that part of Spain is like down on the, on the immediate coastal area. Frigiliana is one of these places that captures that Mediterranean imagination, the mindset of the white, you know, the famous white-walled setting with the stone or or paved streets, uh, the blue, the blue doors and windows, the red tile roofs, and so on. Um, it is beautiful, and with your local guide, you can walk and tour the city. Uh, well, city, this, these communities, these little towns. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You could simply stop at one of the many uh, coffee shops or cafes that are that are available, and just spend uh, an hour or so sipping coffee or perhaps go into a gift store if uh, you want to do a, if a little shopping is your preference but it is a very scenic place it's very photo it's very photogenic and um, being so close to the coast uh, it really imparts a very mediterranean feeling from frigiliana you will travel to nearby nerha and nerha also uh, has a lot of that white walled effect but it is right on the coast, and it is famous for its scenic coastlines, its vistas, and so on. And there in Nerha, uh, they actually—I don't have a, a photo of it, unfortunately—but there is, uh, there is an, uh, like a large plaza, a circular plaza perched up over a cliff for, that offers amazing vista points. Um, there are other things to see in this area, but this captures the spirit, I, I hope, of what. Uh, uh, an excursion along the Mediterranean coastline is like. The birders, meanwhile, will go back up to the Granada, the, the general Granada region. This is about an hour from the ship. We will board coaches and we will drive into the interior into some agricultural lands and some foothills. And we will, we hope to see uh, an array of very special birds. 
Um, it, we are quite successful with this on our 2019 voyage. Birds that we hope to see, again, here is a representation of what is possible. Birds like lesser kestrel on the top left, the beautiful Montague's Harrier, uh, bottom center, the top right, the little bustard. Little bustard along with great bustard uh, still occur in numbers in Spain. Uh, like so many places, birds of native grassland uh, are not doing so well, but Spain still has got a good sized population of these things. And hopefully, hopefully uh, we will be able to see the, uh, the little bustard. We have a place for it. And then in the lower right, the very special black weed ear within on the European continent, only southern, uh, southern Spain um, and I believe Portugal, uh, but certainly Spain is where the black weed ear occurs. And there are a couple of sites around Granada where this bird occurs and we hope to see it. Well, the little bustard was one of the birds I most wanted to see. I'd never seen it and uh, I loved all the birds we saw, but what was added to it at this time of year, they were displaying, the males were displaying, flying up there, doing a flight display, doing flight displays on the ground to attract a female. So it was a very special thing for me to see it. Exactly, and we will make an effort to pinpoint this very special bird. Once we uh, reboard the ship in Motril, at that point, we will just make our way up to Valencia. I don't say just make our way because through much of this uh, remaining voyage, we will be along the, you know, near the coastline, getting a unique view of Spain that many people don't get. Uh, again, uh, presentations by the vent staff, uh, the sea cloud staff, uh, opportunities for birding, uh, marine mammal, uh, we'll watch for marine mammals, I should say. So, you know, uh, the, the trip from Motril to Valencia, uh, it requires another f a night and a full day at sea, but uh, we do disembark in Valencia, and from there we will travel straight to the airport. Uh, Victor? Well, I'm mentioning the staff. Let's call special attention to Larry Wolf. Mm -hmm. He's a silver professor of Mediterranean mm -hmm. history at New York University, and uh, his lectures are some of the best I've ever heard on any cruise about the whole history of the Mediterranean in general, and particularly of the Iberian Peninsula. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Spain is so wonderful that, you know, when you get off the ship, in some ways, you wish you could just keep on going. Um, some people in 2019 made uh, additional plans to spend time in Valencia following the trip, because Valencia in itself um, is worth is worth time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not have time to include any more in our program, but it's something to think about. So as we um, as we wrap up that part of our presentation, I leave you with this image. Um, this is an in, sort of an enduring image of the sea cloud at sea under full sail. Um, it is spectacularly beautiful and uh, well, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just a beautiful sight, and to be a part of it is uh, is truly a memorable experience. Here is a summary of the program. Spain and Portugal aboard the Sea Cloud, April 19 through 29, 2022, with uh, Victor and I as tour leaders. Joining us will be Larry Wolf, as Victor was just talking about. That is an image of Larry on the lower right side of the screen there, and Larry and uh, and his wife Perry Kloss, who herself uh, is an exceptional person, will be joining us uh, on this voyage. Cabins begin at twelve thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars per person in double occupancy from Lisbon. The trip ends in Valencia. We emphasize that uh, all of the event staff, fellow participants. Um, need to be vaccinated to join the program. And so we feel we we feel generally good about it or as optimistic as we can under the continuing circumstances. Due to the pandemic, the Sea Cloud held back 10 cabins. They recently released eight of those cabins. We are now offering a discount of $2,000 per person on these cabins. Mask wearing is no longer required on the Sea Cloud or out our outings except for inside buildings such as museums. 
All passengers and crew members have been vaccinated. Both Portugal and Spain have vaccinated 90% of its citizens. A voyage on the sea cloud is one of the best travel experiences anyone can have. We hope you will take advantage of this great opportunity. We expect all these unsub cabins to be filled soon. Now, before we sign off here, uh, we know that uh, some people either will not be able to travel uh, with us to Portugal and Spain next year, or maybe perhaps you simply aren't as interested in this program, but yet you wanted to tune in to hear about it. Um, we just want to run through a cruise opportunities while we have your attention. Greece, a circumnavigation of the Peloponnese. This is a trip that will operate uh, in late May next year, not long after our sea cloud trip to Portugal and Spain. And here again, I know that Victor, uh, Victor feels fondly about this trip and would like to discuss Well, it. thanks to my father, I grew up hearing a lot about ancient Greece. And so it was always something I was interested in reading Homer, reading Plato, and meeting my friend Paul Woodruff, you see on that right there, who is the lecturer on the trip. And to go to Greece is to go to really, in many ways, the origin of our civilization, the plays, the history, history, first books ever on history, the first plays. Uh, so many things about Greece make it fascinating to me and many other people. Well, Barry and I came up with the idea of working with a cruise company in Greece of circumnavigating the Peloponnesus, which is the least populated part of Greece and has some of the most amazing sites. One is a theater that seats about a thousand people, is the original theater that was built by the, uh, by the Greeks, where it's so constructed and how they did this with the uh, material they had then and the technology they had then, you could drop a penny in the bottom of the theater and hear it in the back. But we visit that theater. We also visit Olympia, where the games were played for a thousand years. There's really nothing else in the world that's ever been done that I know for a thousand years in the same spot. And you actually see the field that the athletes ran on when they competed in the Olympics. And there's a wonderful museum there with an incredible statue of uh, Dionysus holding the baby. And then you go to, from Olympia, you go to Delphi, where Apollo would get the information from the, uh, from the Oracle of Delphi. So just very historic places, beautiful places, and birds also, that all, the, are all during this trip, we've seen some wonderful birds. And uh, so I, I love this trip. This will be about our fourth or fifth time to do it. And to have Paul Woodruff, who teaches philosophy and uh, all about philosophy and all about Greece at the University of Texas is a real highlight. Absolutely, and we will have uh, the itinerary will be uh, up on the website. We thank you for your patience and for your interest in this in the, in this trip and for spending time with Victor and me this afternoon. And we want to thank Ben Reynolds for setting up this program and running this webinar for us. Wonderful. Thank you both for that excellent presentation. Uh, now I would like to ask the audience uh, for questions. Uh, Robert wants to know if, if they can't do the trip this year, how often will it be repeated? Uh, well, it's it's hard to know. Um, you know, we are we we know that our next voyage aboard the Sea Cloud is planned for 2023 and that is going to be the lesser antilles uh we are actually right now we've, we've just recently started uh, our discussions with sea cloud cruises about our next voyage um so looking ahead to 2024 uh, we may choose to do another run of the lesser antilles or we may consider the spain portugal trip again but uh we at this time uh, are not sure Mandolin has a question about the temperature in Spain and Portugal. What would they expect during this program? It should be mild. We've, uh, we've designed this trip basically for springtime. Flowers will be blooming, migrating birds will be coming back. Uh, I expect it to be delightful. Uh, you never can tell about temperature. There could be a cold front coming down. It could be a little cooler than, than uh, sometimes. Uh, but it's, it's before the heat of summer. We designed it before the heat that Europe gets 
particularly Southern Europe, and now it's getting expanded to other parts of Europe, in particularly like uh, later in the, in the, you know, later in the year. So it should be delightful. Yeah, definitely. The um, <clears throat> early to into middle April, even late April, is quite cool and enjoyable. When we did this trip the last time, we had a, a nice blend of uh, sunny, warm days. We had a little bit of rain, but it wasn't disruptive to the program. So uh, cool to mild weather is expected. And can you tell us again about the details of mask wearing? Okay, the details of mask wearing, we just talked to the people in the Sea Cloud yesterday, and the European policies are changing. As you know, Denmark has totally uh, uh, abandoned any uh, regulations because of the virus, because Europe is very heavily vaccinated, 90% in Portugal, 90% in Spain or more, more highly vaccinated than the United States. So the only mask wearing would be when you go inside of a room of a museum. And then for some reasons, as you walk into the dining room, so people are walking in as a group, you wear your mask as you walk in and then take it off right as soon as you get in the dining room and sit down at a table. So basically, almost no mask wearing. You can walk around the ship. You could be, lunch will be on the Lido deck outside. There's no mask wearing at lunch there. Or obviously, no mask wearing when you're having dinner. So virtually no mask wearing at all. Very, very little mask wearing. Uh, we have a question here that uh, wonders if there are any early morning departures. Should they expect any early morning departures? No, no, no. 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 The kind of birding we're doing, the kind of places we're going, uh, and the ship, they're not far away. Granada is not very far away from where we get off the ship. No, no early morning de departures. Very relaxed and delightful trip. Uh, we have a question here from Jan. Uh, she wonders about the cuisine. Will the cuisine on the sea cloud reflect the cuisine of Portugal and Spain? It will in the sense that it particularly has a lot of fish that are freshly caught. That's one of the many wonderful things about the sea cloud. They don't have frozen fish. They defrost and serve you. They get fish they buy at the port. It's freshly caught. But yeah, wonderful European food and some of the food uh, would reflect Portugal and and of course, you're going to have a dinner uh, in Portugal the night before you do your uh, that you arrive in the beautiful hotel we stay in, yeah. a gorgeous hotel in Portugal. So uh, yes, to some extent it will, but the food will be superb. And also, particularly at the lunches, which are outdoors on Lido deck, they have a buffet lunch, and it's it's an amazing buffet lunch with a lot of different choices. Yeah, what I would add to that uh, to to Victor's comments is that. Um, one of the things that the Sea Cloud does, one of the features of the way they do things is that you know, they run their ships in a number of places. They make a point of purchasing products that are from the that are that are either harvested or grown locally. So that is, you know, being on being coastal countries, that is why fish makes up a big part of the, the diet in coastal Spain and Portugal. And so it's not a problem for a Sea Cloud to get fish and so on locally and also uh, locally grown produce as well in a lot of cases. So, uh, you know, there, there will certainly be a good flavor of, of that, uh, of cuisine from that region. And they accommodate other people. If there are people that don't eat fish, they'll have something for yeah, them yeah. too. But I do want to add that one of the biggest problems of being on the sea cloud is at the end, you won't want to get off the sea cloud. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like that's all of our questions uh, for the live segment. So if you would like to have anything for your closing remarks before we uh, end our broadcast today. Well, I just to add what I said, I'm very happy we're doing this program again. It was a tremendous success the first time. I know it will be this time. We have a wonderful group of people already signed up and we hope to fill these new cabins that become available. And uh, it is one of the great experiences of the world to be on the Sea Club. Yes. What I would add to that is that, uh, you know, obviously, um, given the all that's occurred in the world in the last two years, um, you know, we are well aware of the concerns that people have had and probably continue to have about traveling during this time. Um, you know, our sense, and I think the facts bear this out, is that things are improving and they're improving rapidly now. But also to reassure anybody who is considering this trip or any of our other tours or cruises, 
Um, Vent is doing just about all that it can to take the, per, the proper precautions to keep its employees and travelers safe. Uh, we just, as Victor referenced a moment ago, we had a discussion with Sea Cloud Cruises yesterday, and a big part of our top our, of our of our discussion with them centered on health and safety protocols. And there will be testing. Uh, you know, testing will be is, will be in place to get it to get into Portugal. Pe testing will be in place before people board the ship. Testing will be in place you know, upon embarkation. And uh, you know, and so we we feel confident that this trip can be run, uh, you know, safely and uh, with everybody's best interests in mind. And let me add to this: we just, after a whole couple of years of dealing with the pandemic, had our first cruise we offered it on the Amazon. And again, we took all these precautions. And on that Amazon trip, and on a very very fine ship, which we repeat every year, and on the Sea Cloud, there is a doctor on board. So if anyone starts having what they think are symptoms, they can be uh, checked out on board and there are quarantine rooms. And if someone did come down with a virus on the ship, they could be in a quarantine room. And uh, there will be, as I say, a doctor on board for the Amazon trip we just did. It was a tremendous success and no one got sick. They were tested before. They were tested when they got off the boat to go back to the yeah. United States. Everyone was fine. It was our first cruise and it was a tremendous success. There were no problems with the virus. Well, great. Thank you for those details. Uh, thanks for the presentation today, Victor and Barry. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for this webinar on the Sea Cloud. Hope everybody has a great day. We'll see you next time. Thank you.